because the port Hello everyone. Uh, you are you are live now. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with Dr. Aline. Uh, you discuss amazing talk today in this uh, fellow oral uh, presentation uh, to complete the fellowship. Uh, the topic is uh, dry eye disease in cataract surgery. Who uh, follow me, who is my resident, is my colleagues, know that I love this topic, that I love this, this topic uh, uh, about uh, dry eye disease. Hello, Dr. Sara, are you ready mm -hmm. too? I'm ready. Yes, great. And Dr. Sara, uh, you discuss about uh, cornea disease in, in cataract surgery. Mm -hmm. So we will start with Dr. Aline. Aline, it's uh, the, the, the stage is yours. Thank you. All right. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My name is Aline, and I'm from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Sergio for this wonderful international fellowship and for organizing this platform to present. Today, I'll be discussing on something familiar to everyone, which is dry eye in cataract patients. This is the overview for today. Dry eye is a multifactorial disease of the ocular surface. The TIFOS DUCE 2 in 2017 elicited many etiologies of tear film instability, hyperosmolarity, ocular surface inflammation, and neurosensory abnormalities, which all cause the loss of homeostasis of the tear film, and which is accompanied by ocular symptoms. The Asia Dry Eye Society has also described that dry eye is a multifactorial disease characterized by unstable tear film causing a variety of symptoms. While there are many pathologic mechanisms of dry eye disease, the concept of tear hyperosmolarity and tear film instability play important roles which cause cell damage, cytokine release, goblet cell loss on the ocular surface and disturbance of mucin expression leading to a vicious cycle. There are also multiple other external risk factors including ocular surgeries like cataract surgery and LASIK. In MGD, meromine gland blockage, inflammation and dropout lead to proliferation of pathogens on the ocular surface. Globally, the prevalence of dry eye ranges from 5 to 50% with large variations between countries. 20% of the Asian population and 15% of the Americans have dry eye. However, the incidence in cataract patients is higher than anticipated. In a study conducted by William Trettler et al., 62.9% had tear breakup time of less than 5 seconds. 77% had positive corneal staining and about half had positive central corneal stain. Gupta et al. in a study emphasized on the disconnection between clinical signs and patient reported symptoms in preoperative cataract assessments. 85% of asymptomatic patients had abnormal point of care tests, and overall, 80% had at least one abnormal tear test. A number of studies have shown signs and symptoms of dry eye disease after cataract surgery and worsening of pre-existing dry eye after surgery. 145 publications concerning this association were reviewed by Nadri et al. Some studies have also emphasized the importance of optimizing ocular surface disease before cataract surgery for successful outcomes. Corneal nerve transection in cataract surgery can reduce corneal sensitivity, altering the tear film homeostasis. Reduction in corneal sensitivity is proportionate to the length and depth of incision and is influenced by additional corneal procedures like LRIs and arcuate keratotomies. 
Thaco emulsification with the smallest incision size has significant advantage over both the classic ACCE and SICS. Long duration of microscopic light exposure causes phototoxicity. Other intraoperative factors, including surface toxicity induced by irrigating fluids, topical anesthetics, preservatives, and antibiotics. Femtosecond laser assisted surgery has a higher risk of dry eye symptoms than conventional emulsification. If not addressed, tear film problems can lead to decreased predictability in IRL power selection, especially in premium IRLs. Errors in the power and axis of the toric IRL, keratometry variability, and abnormal corneal topography. Epitropolis et al. states that hyperosmolarity can cause higher keratometry variability. 35% of patient dissatisfaction was related to dry eyes after surgery, and the degree of dissatisfaction is magnified in refractive cataract surgery with the premium IRL. In the proof study by McDonald et al., 57.6% of dry eye patients had moderate or worse blurred vision versus 10.5% of controls despite 2020 vision. Blepharitis has interesting implications in a preoperative cataract patient and may be correlated with an increased risk of endophthalmitis. As dry eye disease is difficult to be accurately diagnosed, a list of algorithms and guidelines have been proposed. Careful history taking and triaging triaging questions are employed to exclude conditions that mimic dry eye. Dry eye questionnaire 5 or OSD index are used to screen. A positive symptom score with one of the signs of either a reduced tear breakup time, increased osmolarity or ocular surface staining confirms this diagnosis. Corneal and conjunctival staining have been shown to be informative markers of disease severity in severe dry eye disease. However, staining of the ocular surface in mild or moderate dry eye disease showed poor correlation with disease severity. MGD is considered a leading cause of evaporative dry eye. Mebography allows observation of the silhouette of the mebomian gland morphological structure, demonstrating a sensitivity of 84.9% and specificity of 96.7%. The lippy view interferometry is a non-invasive way to allow automated measurement of the thickness of the lipid layer in the tear film. It is 65.8% sensitive and 63.4% specific. This readily available test is a quick, simple, sensitive, and specific method for determining tear osmolarity. The higher the osmolarity value, the more severe the disease. Sullivan et al. suggests that tear osmolarity of more than 308 milliosmoles per liter or inter-eye difference of more than eight is suggestive of dry eye disease. The ASCRS Corneal Clinical Committee devised a pre-surgical specific algorithm for diagnosing all ocular surface disease before refractive surgery, including a new preoperative screening questionnaire called SPEED2. It is simple and can be easily incorporated into practice workflow. Accurate biometric and keratometric assessments with repeated tests are essential. In a study by Liu et al., an irregular topographic pattern was observed in 45% of dry eyes which decreased to about 31% after the installation of artificial tears. The image on the right shows the pre and post dry eye treatment topography. You can see irregular myers with ste a steeper K in the upper image, as compared to the image below showing a smoother placido disc imaging with flatter K values after treatment. This goes to show that the optimization of ocular surface improves accuracy. MMP9 has been found to be elevated in patients with dry eye and different types of OSD, including Sjogren's syndrome and MGD. It has been shown to correlate with dry disease progression over time. The test is positive if MMP9 is detected to be more than 40 nanogram per milliliter. This test is 85% sensitive and 94% specific. It is important to understand that signs and symptoms of dry eye do not correlate. In patients with symptoms but no signs, a diagnosis of neuropathic corneal pain should be considered. Conversely, in asymptomatic patients with significant signs of OSD, neurotrophic conditions with poor corneal sensitivity should be considered. Based on the ASCRS preoperative OSD algorithm, examination includes looking at the lids, lashes for blepharitis, nebomitis, chalasias, the meniscus, and interpalpable conjunctiva and cornea. Lifting the upper lid to examine the superior cornea for SLKs and EBMDs, 
pulling forward for lit lexities and pushing by expressing the enablement brands. OSD is either ruled in or out. If ruled in, the visual significance is determined. If it is non-visually significant OSD, surgery and refractive plan can be carried out with prophylactic treatment and proper counseling that OSD may worsen. If visually significant OSD, surgery must be delayed with good counseling and aggressive treatment to reduce the delay. Typical incision sizes in modern FACO are less than three millimeters, but micro incisional of less than two millimeters are less disruptive. Astigmatic keratotomy incisions would need careful surgical planning. Usage of preservative free drops, reducing perioperative topical medications, use of dispersive OVD, limiting surgical time, adequate exposure of light from the microscope can all reduce the risk of dry eye. And last but not least, direct ocular surface trauma is kept to the minimum with careful tissue handling. This is a very busy slide of the dry eye disease management, which is beyond the scope of today's presentation. A non-rigid stepwise approach is recommended, starting from simple to complex therapies. And the main aim is to reduce inflammation and to restore tear firm homeostasis. Mild diseases take about four to six weeks, but moderate to severe ones may take several months. Therapy in the pre-operative setting should minimally start at at least step two of the TFOS DUCE 2 guidelines. There's, these are some of the medications to control inflammation. 16.6% of patients in the cyclosporin 0.09% group experience an improvement in Schirmer's 2 tear test results as compared with 9.2% of the vehicle group. Lifidograss impacts on refractive accuracy. In two phase three studies, there is significant improvement in dry eye disease as early as two weeks after starting treatment. Veronicline is a highly selective nicotinate acetylcholine receptor agonist nasal spray. In a phase three randomized trial, about half of the patients achieved a primary endpoint in both treatment groups as compared to about 28% of the vehicle group. There are also other medications available in Asia, like diquafasol and repelipide, which is in mucin secretagogues. What about MGD? These are some of the office-based treatment modalities that can relieve the chronic stasis and obstruction of meconium glands, like the intense pulse light, the lipid flow thermal pulsation, ILUX or tear care, which is non-inferior to lipid flow, and microblepharal exfoliation. Cataract surgery is refractive surgery. While cataract surgeries have evolved to become refractive procedures, there are still many unmet needs that persist in the context of dry eye disease in cataract patients. The development of algorithmic approaches for effective screening of OSD and reliable diagnosis can go a long way in making cataract surgery safer with more predictable and successful outcomes. In summary, Dry eye is a complex multifactorial disease which can affect the quality of life of cataract patients. Identification of dry eye is important in both the pre-operative and post-operative care to ensure that the ocular surface is optimized. Hence, it is imperative to screen all patients for dry eye and MGD to improve refractive accuracy. Follow an algorithm to diagnose before surgery. And finally, counsel and treat these patients to ensure the highest level of satisfaction for both the patient and surgeon satisfaction. With that, thank you. Dr. Aline, can you listen to me? Uh, amazing lecture. I really like uh, how you present, how you, you did the research about the, the recently papers. And the ESCRS protocol too is a, a good topic to discuss. Uh, I think uh, the next uh, fellows, are you are you tell to discuss more about uh, uh, dry eye disease because dry eye disease is really important and really congratulations you are approved. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, now I will invite if you you want to to say any words uh, some words about the fellow uh, how you prepare to eat if everything okay for you. Yes, um, I think this is a wonderful um, fellowship and platform that you've created for us. And thank you very much for having all of us. Thanks. It's a pleasure uh, to, to help to improve the, uh, your knowledge. 
but uh, I'm really surprised how my fellowships uh, have many uh, knowledge too. It's uh, every 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 uh, lecture that I, I see here, I can see how you prepare it so well. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie, can you invite Sara to, to come to us? Hello, Sara. Hello, how are you doing? Everything okay as well. I know you do uh you you do an amazing lecture for us <laughs> as well. And please tell us where you was last week, last weekend with this yeah. was a, 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 like a, a holidays or work? <laughs> Well, I was first in London because one of my husband's friends was getting married um, in the countryside. Really beautiful. But then I went to a conference. So um, I'm a comprehensive ophthalmologist. Uh, I do cornea also, but I am interested in some cosmetics. So it was actually called the Cosmetic Boot Camp. Um, it's great. Not I don't no financial interest, but <laughs> I wish I did. Yes, but, yes, um, I know, I know. Yeah. We're not the only one day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was specifically for physicians. So um, ophthalmologists, uh, plastic surgeons, derm and ENT. So it's really nice to hear different specialties, um, kind of just like we do here. So, um, you know, able to chat about the different parts of the eye and how they might affect um, surgery. So here we're going to talk about cataract surgery and patients who have coexisting uh, corneal disease. Let's go. All right, let's go. Um, so the first thing we're going to look at is when to address corneal disease um, prior to or at the time of cataract surgery. So sometimes we stage, um, sometimes you combine um, both procedures kind of patient specific. The timing of cornea and cataract surgery to optimize outcome. So kind of figuring out who your patients are, are they type A, type B, um, if having a optimal refractive outcome is going to be important to them, then a staged procedure may um, be better uh, than trying to combine. Um, and then also we have to consider different uh, lenses and what kind of lenses we're going to use in these patients because not all of the lenses are a good fit for patients who do have corneal pathology. So diving right in. So this is our first patient. So this is a double pterygium, double pterygium meaning coming from nasal and temporal. Um, this patient has also had LASIK and they also have a cataract. So they come to you um, and they say, you know, I want to get out of glasses, doc. What do we do? So you can see on um, the, the topography on the right um, that there's some flattening uh, in the meridian of the pterygium. Um, and so the first thing you have to think about is your refractive outcome and uh, if this patient's going to want to be out of glasses, because if that's the case, you may want to stage this by doing the uh, pterygium removal first. Um, letting the cornea stabilize and repeating the biometry. Um, I'm not sure how long you wait, but I tend to do three months. Um, uh, and then we get consistent biometry and then we can further talk about um, other intraocular lenses that may be a good fit. Um, you want to use a lens that neutralizes spherical aberrations because uh, myopic LASIK or PRK, this is myopic specifically, um, you want to choose a negative aspheric IOL um, since these patients have positively aberrant corneas, um, you don't want to increase their aberrations. They're going to be really unhappy. And oftentimes these patients have very high expectations um, because they've been out of glasses for a while, um, uh, having been motivated to get LASIK in uh, the past. Um, caution with multifocals as well, because that can increase uh, your spherical aberrations. So this slide is just to kind of chat a little bit about um, the kind of uh, surgery that everyone does for uh, trigia. You know, there's the perfect technique. Some people do a rotational autograph. Um, there's a discussion of, you know, their sclera versus amniotic membrane versus um, conjunctival autograft. Um, I tend to be in the conjunctival autograft uh, camp um, since that does show the least amount of recurrence um, out of the options. You never want to leave bare sclera. They have a really high incidence of recurrence in that case. Moving on. So anterior basement membrane dystrophy. Um, previous lectures, great. Um, dry eye is something that I deal with all day, every day. Um, and so making sure that you have very good um, input, good biometry is going to be 
essential for picking what kind of lens and for patients to be happy. That was such a beautiful overview um, of dry eye um, and the algorithm that we now use uh, preoperatively for um, uh, cataract surgery for our dry eye patients. So just like dry eye, anterior basement membrane dystrophy has a lot of um, overlap in terms of symptoms. Um, you get a loss of homeostasis of the tear film, um, as was mentioned in the previous lecture. Um, so sometimes what I do with these patients, especially if I see a lot of irregularity, if it's in the visual axis, I will do superficial keratectomy. Um, we allow stabilization and healing of the epithelium for six to eight weeks, uh, and then repeat the biometry, topography, kind of see what our placebo is doing, um, and look at our pentacam. So another thing to consider is gas permeable contact lenses are very helpful in these cases to see how much irregularity of the cornea it nullifies. Um, really helpful in patients with anterior corneal irregularities, um, such as elevated anterior stromal scars, such Salzman nodules, or anterior basement membrane dystrophy. This can even help with um, uh, dry eye as well. Um, this just helps counseling, see how much of the vision may be coming from the cornea or the blur may be coming from the cornea, how much is coming from the cataract. Um, and then we're able to kind of better counsel these patients um, and also for long term. So if they are very motivated for, say, a multifocal IOL, um, you have to really counsel them, get their dry eye in a really good spot, their symptoms in a good spot, and then warn them that, you know, the, the dystrophy could recur after cataract surgery. Um, of note, the rigid gas permeables are not going to help um, with corneal edema or deeper corneal pathology, things that need endothelial um, graphs, um, just really helpful for that anterior um, uh, stromal scarring degenerations. Um, Saltzman's, like I mentioned, do fall under the same category, um, but many cases are ignored just because they tend not to affect your, their best corrected vision too much, especially if the patient wears glasses. Um, but at the time of cataract surgery, it can make it really difficult to do an appropriate IOL selection. Um, so this can limit our IOL options. So if you do see Saltzman nodules, consider actually, and the irregularity on the uh, topography or tomography um, that's potentially going to affect the patient's vision, you may want to consider Consider doing a superficial keratectomy first um, and then reevaluating. Again, it depends on your patient, how motivated your patients are. Um, okay, so moving on to the big one. So Fuchs, Fuchs endothelial dystrophy and cataracts. So there's a few ways to skin the cat, as they say. Um, so first is stage surgery. So cataract surgery should be done first and only if there's a significant cataract, there's only mild, mild, mild coronary disease, no edema. Um, and one of the big questions to ask is morning blurring. So are you getting blurring in the morning that gets better throughout the day? Um, if that's the case, then that's likely a reflection of their Fuchs. Um, you want to consider a DMEC first and only if there's no visually significant cataract. Um, if there's visually significant or severe corneal disease, if you're starting to see scarring or decimate folds, um, or if you need astigmatism correction at the time of cataract surgery, uh, then you may want to do the DMEC first, see where you land, and then that helps you uh, plan your uh, IOL. And then as Dr. Uh, Kanabrava mentioned, you should do a specular microscopy and get an endothelial count to know what the shape of the cornea um, is in. If the patient has obvious corneal edema, you want to consider a pachymeter. Um, uh, results can help guide your surgical decisions. So if the cornea is more than 600, some people say 620, uh, you want to consider a combined fake ODMEC or a fake ODSEC. If less than that, then um, you just want to make sure you're using a lot of dispersive viscoelastic, um, refill the anterior chamber with it um, often, uh, and you want to fake o as far away from the endo as possible, but not too close to the posterior capsule. Um, so moving on. So when do we combine these procedures? So we combine them when there is a visually significant cataract, you have visually significant corneal disease, they have morning blurring, um, they have corneal edema. Um, you wanna consider shifting your target more myopic um, to compensate for the shift that happens with the transplant. Um, that becomes very important, especially if you're considering any kind of premium lenses in these patients and you wanna be careful um, about that as well, which we will chat about um, in the next slide. Uh, the hardest part about uh, combined uh, FACO DMAC is actually the cataract part um, because the cornea tends to become swollen during the surgery um, and it 
uh, impede your visualization. Uh, if that happens, uh, sometimes you can just remove the epithelium um, and that can increase the um, clarity. Uh, however, that only lasts for a certain period of time and then the cornea will start to get edematous. Um, so oftentimes the biggest struggle with these cases is to do the, uh, the cataract, um, especially because we don't want that super big dilation because we're going to make the uh, pupil pinpoint afterwards so we can then go ahead and do the DMEC procedure. Um, so uh, these can be challenging, so just choose them wisely. So now discussing about um, corneal higher order aberrations over time. So um, you can clearly see that based on these um, graphs, uh, the objective scatter index or OSI, as well as the total corneal HOA, um, you want to be very cautious with these patients and doing presbyopia correcting lenses um, just because these patients do have um, pathology that could limit their visual acuity and um, their corneal higher order aberrations can definitely impede the quality of their visual acuity, even if everything's on target. Next, um, so cataract with the iris defect. Um, so this is an uh, interesting case. So um, you can combine these if the patient has visually significant glare um, and they have a cataract. So oftentimes we'll do just colored contact lenses um, for patients with iris defects. Um, and if they can't tolerate the contact lens, then maybe it's time to consider um, doing some kind of surgical intervention that you could potentially do at the same time um, as cataract surgery. Um, uh, this is something that you want to have a game plan uh, before you start um, uh, and also discuss with the patient um, uh, if you want to do some kind of iris prosthesis, maybe down the line, um, and then paying close attention to your, your bag, kind of where you're putting your lens, if you're going to end up putting it in the sulcus, um, or in the bag, uh, preferably. Um, but sometimes with iris defects, you can't combine these, these surgeries. Moving on. So corneal scars. So, um, with corneal scars, sometimes these can be a little difficult um, to determine what kind of visual potential you're going to get. Um, like I mentioned earlier, it can be helpful to do a rigid gas permeable lens to see what their visual potential is by removing some of that corneal irregularity. Sometimes a scleral can be helpful. Um, if they have a big corneal scar, not much of a cataract, send them for a scleral contact lens. See what their vision does. Um, if they're, Sometimes these patients can get to 20-20 vision. You'd be surprised. Um, so you can hold off, obviously, on the cataract surgery if they have a corneal scar that's corrected with the scleral contact lens. Um, if you are taking them to surgery, so you want to consider doing the EKR65. I have a pentacam, so that's what I tend to use. Um, uh, also, you could consider using the eye wall from the fellow eye. So do measurements for the fellow eye and choose an eye wall based off that. That's what we tend to do in penetrating keratoplasties. Um, counsel on the possible need for an RGP or a scleral even after the surgery. Um, we always do this whenever we're talking about penetrating keratoplasties because these patients do need um, uh, contact lenses after surgery for their best uh, vision. So um, they may think that the cataract surgery is going to get them completely out of a contact lens. So you want to make sure you counsel them. Um, and then excitingly, at least in the United States, um, this lens was just released. Um, so this is the IC8. So this is a small aperture IOL. So it's used for very irregular corneas. Um, it works through pinhole optics. Um, so this is really exciting uh, for some of our patients with irregular corneas. Some people use them for presbyopia. Um, I'm not really in that camp. Uh, but I do think that this can be really helpful for some of our patients that don't really have great options. Um, and that leads us into keratoconus. So keratoconus is one of the most common things that we see in the cornea clinic. Um, same thing as kind of corneal scarring. You want to use your, your EKR65, um, consider using the IOL of the other eye, um, counsel them and potentially needing an RGP or a scleral afterward. Um, like I mentioned before, do a pretrial with a contact lens um, and consider potentially doing a PK um, before or after. Uh, so what I tend to do is I put a contact lens or send them to my, my optometrist um, to fit them for scleral. If they're worse than 2040 in that scleral, uh, then I would consider a PK prior to cataract surgery. Or you could do a PK with an open sky if you uh, if you have the the 
<laughs> wherewithal to do that, let's just say. Um, and then the other thing that you want to do is the compare two maps um, on your uh, Pentacam. That can be really helpful. Make sure they're not continuing to change. If you need to do cross-linking before, you're going to consider doing a um, you know cataract. Um, although that typically does tend to occur more so in teens and um, 20s. So these patients don't tend to need cataract surgery. Um, and then also you want to make sure there's stability if you are considering on um, astigmatism correction. You want to make sure that that uh, astigmatism is stable. Otherwise, you're just going to be chasing a moving target and the patient might be happy for a little bit. Um, but if the cornea continues to change, then that astigmatism correction is not going to be helpful. All right. Well, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. And thank you for this putting this fellowship together. I've really been um, enjoying uh, the different lectures and um, I look forward to the next time. Sarah, amazing lecture. Uh, you did an amazing overview about the, the cornea disease. Uh, I like it when you discuss about the cornea scar, the option of IC8. Many doctors don't, don't know about the IC8. It's a, a, a good option in this, in this kind of patient. Keratoconazine is an important, important topic. Uh, when you uh, perform cataract surgery, you need to have the right uh, the right uh, calculator. If you do the, the, the calculator in the, in the uh, for example, a holiday or in a, a barity, you can have a, a problem. You need to use cane, keratoconus, or a barry true K. It's a really important point. And so uh, you, you use your lecture in Dr. Aline lecture. Uh, please, uh, Stephanie, can you uh, put here Dr. Uh, Aline Chu. Yes, hello Aline. Hello. Two amazing lectures today. Uh, uh, you use your two lectures is sent for our uh, our followers to to know your lecture. I I, I really uh, know that it you help help another doctors that follow the program and follow my channel. Any any words, Sara, before you go to the private private room to to other fellows to discuss about the June topics. No, just thank you for having me. And I really enjoyed um, your lecture as well. I think dry eye was something that needs to be covered, especially when we're talking about all these premium lenses. So that was really helpful. Um, mm -hmm. Really enjoyed your lecture. I really enjoyed the lecture too. Thank you. Okay, see you in see you both in two minutes in the Google Google uh, Google Meet, yes, Google Meet room, okay? Thank you. See you. Bye.